Well, today we are continuing with our Bible exposition from the book of Acts. Today we'll be considering chapter 24, the second part. That is uh, in uh, chapter 24, the second part from verses 10 to verses 21. To verses 21. And uh, as always, I'll begin by reading for us the verse and then I explain the verse. So Paul is defense before Felix. Bible says in verse 10, And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been uh, a judge of uh, this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. So the first thing for us to consider is to refresh our minds with the first exposition we did in chapter 24. Of course, in the first exposition, we saw Tertullus's speech against Paul and how he laid many false charges against the apostle. However, he ended by saying he wanted the governor to examine Paul so that he may also be able to realize that everything they had said about Paul were indeed true. So in verses 10, we see that when the governor had nodded to him, uh, to speak, Paul replied, saying, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You see, well articulated, and but, but the first thing for us to understand is to understand this person, this governor that is called Felix. We know that he was a Roman governor of Judea who was maintained in the same office between six to seven years until Nero recalled him to Rome. However, the other thing for us that we can know about Felix is that he was an oppressive ruler who had three wives, but his famous wife was a Jewish woman that was known as Drusilla. So, dealing with the verse before us, we see Paul responded to all the charges that were brought against him after Felix had signaled to him or had nodded or alerted him. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he had the right to reply to his actual accusers, for the Roman law condemned no man and had. It's why actually Paul was given the opportunity before execution that he should be actually be able to say something of all that was falsely said against him. The second actually observation that we still see here in verses 10 is Paul's cheerful defense that he makes. Of course, we know very much well that First Peter 3.15 tells us to always be ready to give a defense with all respect uh, for the reason as to why we believe what we believe and Jude one three is also very clear that we need to contend for the faith that was once given uh, to the saints. So one thing that you see here is that Paul's cheerful defense was based on the fact that since Felix had lived for long in Judea, he was familiar with the state of affairs in Judea, so he would judge impartially. That's what Paul hoped for because in our last exposition we made it very clear that a judge ought to discern between truth and falsehood. So Paul using the experience that Felix had obtained for a number of years he was actually uh, doing work in Judea. He knew that if he could carefully listen to him he would actually make a clear judgment so but Paul did not by flattering words declare that which was not true as we will basically continue to to see in verses 11 you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem since I went up to worship in Jerusalem so the thing is that Paul denied the charges of actually sedition because it was only 12 days since he came to Jerusalem to keep the feast of Pentecost at the temple. And he indeed incited no one. We all remember very much well from Acts chapter 21. Was peaceable and actually orderly citizen. So he actually verify. He actually makes it very clear before Felix that you can verify. Because if he has been told to examine. He tells him verify that it was not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. So in other words, is debunking all the false accusation of him stirring up the riots. 
in Jerusalem. Verses 12. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogues in in the synagogues or in the city to which we can still verify that in this Paul is explaining the reason as to why he had gone to Jerusalem wasn't to stir up the crowd but he had gone there to worship he had gone there to worship and because he had gone there to worship he says that they never found him disputing with anyone the peaceful purpose of devotion not to produce riot or disorder. That's what, that was the reason as to why he was in Jerusalem. He was there for a peaceful purpose of devotion, not to produce riot or disorder. So he also felt for his suffering. That is one of the things. The second thing is that he also felt for his suffering brothers at Jerusalem, so he had brought them some relief funds, as we remember from Acts chapter 21, Acts chapter 22, and later in this chapter, you can indeed see in verses 17, he talks about, he says, now after several years, I came to bring arms to my nation and to present offerings. So the man is saying that there were, there, there were two reasons as to why he came up to worship. Uh, he came to Jerusalem first was to actually uh, carry out a peaceful, a peaceful actually devotion uh, and uh, devotion not to produce the riot and disorder. And then the second thing was to bring some relief funds to his brethren that were in Jerusalem. And then the other thing that you can indeed also see in verse 13, he says, neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me paul was very clear paul challenged actually the governor challenged uh, his accusers before the governor to present the proof of the charges they had brought up against him number one charge stirring up the crowd number two about the profoning of the temple which they accused him as we also from actually verses five over Acts chapter 24. So before the governor, without hiding anything, it's broad daylight, everyone is listening. He challenges his accusers to bring the proof of him stirring up the crowds, to bring the proof of him profoning the temple. In verses 14, that's the thing that we are always to be armed with. The truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. For the scripture says that Thus, as we continue in the Lord's teaching, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. John 8, 32, verses 14 says now in Acts 24. But this I confess to you, to who? To Felix, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So now, Verses, very, verses 14 is very crucial to us that he responds also to their third charge of him being a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes to which he never actually denied but he also proved that Christianity was not a deviation from Judaism but a fulfillment of it but a fulfillment of it but the fulfillment of it, as we can all actually attest to it, from actually still Romans chapter 3 verses 21, it speaks of this same reality. And then when you also consider Romans chapter 28 and the verses 23, Paul shows one, sim one simple reality. I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. The thing is, what did they believe that he didn't believe? In other words, they believed less of that which was laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Their accusation against him was because they believed less of that that was laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So, 
they were taking issue with an individual that believed more of that which was written and their case which was written to which they never did we need to understand that paul being a pharisee of the pharisee he knew his torah very well and he knew the prophets very well here they could not beat him hands down it's why with all confidence he says i confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect i worship god of our fathers believing everything meaning they were, they were not believing everything if they were believing everything that was laid down by the law and written in the prophets there wouldn't have been a case for them with paul verses 15 having a hope in god having a hope in god which these men themselves accept in their face that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust now we are able now to see here that the pharisee group that paul belonged to before he was converted they were the ones that were after him the pharisees were near to the truth but though they were near to the truth they were deniers of the truth they were near to and so the bible says he says having hope in god which these men themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust so these guys were part these pharisees that were near the truth they were part of his accusers and at one time they defended and protected him in acts chapter 23 verses 6 to 9 they protected and defended him but you have to remember if they cannot refute what you are saying they will attack you for saying it it's what is happening here these pharisees could not refute this reality that god will actually will judge both the living and the dead and there is also the resurrection of the just and the unjust that they could not deny but they were now attacking him for saying for saying what you are saying the just and the unjust here in context the scriptures are very clear will rise again on the last day matthew 25 32 concretizes on the same reality john chapter 5 verses 28 to, to 29 also concretizes on the same reality and the judge of all these that are just and unjust is already said acts chapter 17 verse 30 to 32 so this was foretold by daniel also that you know what the day is coming when all the just and the unjust will be raised and they will all stand before god to give accountability for their lives so they could not deny the things because daniel was one of the prophets that they believed in and so but the case is why are you reminding us of these realities of course we know the build up to all of this is when he said that him being an apostle was commissioned to go to the gentiles and they never wanted to hear anything concerning the gentiles hence the persecution began the accusations and many false things that were levied against him they all came however still in this point that he makes very clear even to our accusers they need to know amidst their accusation of us they should know that if they win us on this side of heaven they will not win us the other side the other side after crossing the just one is watching and they themselves that are laying false accusations about God's servants, they should stand warned that a day is coming when they will stand before the supreme judge of all men, both the just and the unjust. In other words, Paul had given, committed his case before God who judges all men. 16. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both god and man now here is something very important paul actually speaks over something here that is very important he wanted to stand clear before god and he also wanted to stand clear before man after he had mentioned the resurrection of both the just and the unjust he went ahead to explain how he did everything possible you see the verse it says so i always take pains to have clear conscience so he explains how he did everything possible to have a clear conscience he did everything possible 
to make sure that his conscience was clear before God and before man. And so there's a lesson for us to learn here. When the apostle talks about this, I think there are particular things that we can consider to have a pure and clear conscience. What is he alluding to? One of the ways for us to have or to maintain a clear conscience is that one needs to be properly informed in regard to truth and duty. This helps in one not being reproached by his conscience. So if you are well informed about truth and duty, your conscience will actually always be very clear. You know the truth and you live according to that truth. People who are not well informed about the truth and duty, they know not the truth and so they do not know how to live. But if you know the truth, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. A person who has known the truth and he has been set free by the truth, his conscience is always clear. The second thing unto us are uh, keeping a clear conscience is that we ought to do what scripture instructs, not the opposite. We ought to do what the scripture instructs. James 4.17 says, To him who knows the right thing to do, and he does it not, to him is sin. So if we know the right thing to do, and we do it not, that is sin. So before God, Paul did everything possible to do that which was acceptable before God. Before man, Paul did everything possible to do that which was acceptable before man. It's the thing he is actually highlighting and making very clear. Very huge lesson for us also to learn. 17. Now, after several years, I came to bring arms to my nation and to present offerings. So he further explains why he came back to Jerusalem. We saw one of those, it, one of the reason was actually for a peaceful devotion. And now in verse 17, he gives us another reason as to why he came back to, Jel to Jerusalem. And the case was to bring arms to his fellow natives or the Christians that were living in Jerusalem in so many challenging situations. The same thing which is alluded to uh, from the book of Romans chapter 15 verses 25 to 26 and still in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to 4, and then 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 4, they all emphasize the same point. So, because Felix was told to examine him, how would he be able to make a clear judgment? He needed to hear both sides. He first had the, the actually the submissions of uh, Tertullus on behalf of the accusers of Paul, and now Felix is listening and is hearing from Paul is getting to understand, is trying to gain sense of uh, what actually uh, pertains to Paul. And Paul actually makes it very clear that he, he went ahead to explain a number of things. The other thing that he also came back to Jerusalem to present offerings which were connected to the Jewish vow, as we saw from Acts 21 verses 23 to 27. So there were things here. There was the worship there was the bringing of the arms and then there was also the giving of the offering. So you can in fact say that the, the worship and offerings are tied together and then the bringing of arms. Verses 18, he, he adds in something to say, While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple. Instead of Paul uh, profaning in the temple, he was purified in the temple without any crowd or tumults, but some Jews from Asia. The same thing as we saw from Acts chapter 21 verses 27. So, but in verses 19, he says, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation and make an accusation should they have anything against me. The guys that had actually started the entire, the, the, the riots and uh, all things that were unacceptable in Jerusalem, they themselves were not there to present their case. But what they did, they hired one Tertullus to actually place their many accusations against Paul. So Paul proves before, proves that the absence of the Jews from Asia meant something. Meant something. Because this was the right time to settle the whole matter and explain 
how he polluted the temple but they were nowhere to be found so there wasn't any time appropriate like this one for all the accusers of paul to lay out their charges properly in his face before the judge but they were nowhere to be seen you can see that the entire premise of these Jews that were accusing Paul was actually laid upon a faulty foundation. There was no case for them to win. They were actually false accusers. And any, if indeed Felix was interested in wanting to exercise justice in this matter, there are a lot of things that Paul made so very much clear. And uh, the way he laid down his points, indeed you realize why the Jews hired one turtle as to speak on their behalf. The man that is known as Paul was very articulate in all things on to how he led them. Verses 20 to 21 it says, Or oh, how else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Okay, if there are the Jews from Asia and on there, let these men say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council and other than this, one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you, before you this day. So Paul explains what could be the offense for all the false charges against him. It was with respect to the resurrection of the dead, he says, is why he was on trial here. So that is the thing, a whole thing that Felix needed to hear or to understand is this. Paul makes it before him. They were deniers of the very thing that was in their system of theology. Paul said that these things were all written down in the law and in the prophets. But the fact that they were deniers of the very thing that was in their system of theology, he says, is why now I am trial before you, sir. So if this sir is interested in exercising, uh, the rule of law and all that, Paul had given him enough information for him to execute the matter in a way that would not involve any biasness. Everything was clearly articulated. And I'm telling you, whenever you are standing for the truth, and you know that what you're speaking is the truth, it's, the, it's your actually accusers that will be shivering. It's they that will, uh, that will be... That will be uncomfortable. But as for you, you confidently know what the scriptures say. You know the exegetical meaning of the text. It's one thing I want to encourage you guys. And if any person does not understand the exegetical meaning of the text and is trying to impose his mind on the text, therefore the clear meaning of the text will be your vindicator because God himself will be speaking through that very text. And uh, the way we see that's how the defense went before Felix. And there are many other things that we need also to consider as far as the response of Felix as pertaining to this as we shall see in our next exposition when actually we see Felix himself are having uh, some challenges in responding to all that he had from the apostle. So, Lord willing, we shall pick it here to learn more uh, and to consider more as far as what is it that Felix began actually, actually lay on both sides. But this is also a caution to all leaders. In exercising justice, we don't need to be biased. Even if one man is against many or many against one, it's important that we defend both sides. If the one side which is of the main is the truth, you stand with that. If one side which is represented by one, if it is the one on the truth, you stand with that. But the thing of people using the language of democracy, democracy, and uh, they fail into looking into the issue and they say because of democracy, I'm telling you there's a lot of wrong things about it. So Lord willing, we'll pick it from here and then we learn more from verses 22 and, uh, and the following verses as far as uh, what was the response of Felix after all that that Paul laid before him.